So yeah, and I did want to get into, and I think some of our discussion has already started here, kind of when we say machine learning, in some sense, the core concept is, again, very simple, automatically analyzing large amounts of data. But this actually plays out in, in a couple of different ways. And so there are kind of three major paradigms for machine learning. So supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning. And I want to talk about each of those in turn. So supervised learning is a situation where you have a fixed data set that has labels or answers on it, and you're trying to learn some relationship between your raw data and the answers that you have labeled on it. So really maybe easy to grasp, hopefully example there is if you have a ton of images, each of which is labeled dog or cat, you can imagine a machine learning algorithm trying to figure out, okay, I'm getting as input the raw pixels of the image. I'm analyzing something about it. I'm making some kind of guess. And at the other side, I'm being told, am I right or am I wrong? Is it a dog or is it a cat? And then by through kind of iterative feedback, continuing to try to make those guesses and updating its parameters based on the kind of signal on the other side as to whether it was right or wrong, the machine learning algorithm gradually learns how to basically learn this mapping from an image to your label of dog or cat. One way to think about kind of supervised learning tasks is these are situations where a human could do exactly what the machine learning model is doing and probably better. I trust like myself. Mechanical of Amazon, for instance. Yeah, or, or like me, right? Like, I mean, I trust myself in some sense to look at an image and tell you if it's a dog or a cat, except in maybe edge cases where there's some uh, species that look kind of similar. I, kinda, I can pretty confidently tell you I'll be able to do that. Your machine learning algorithm may be wrong every now and then, but it, your machine learning algorithm can do it at much greater scale. I can't label a hundred million images for you. A machine learning algorithm can. And so supervised mm -hmm. learning is really where you want an algorithm to do something at scale that a human could do, but where you're okay with it be done, being done slightly worse uh, because of the scale. But yeah. in, in all cases, supervised learning always includes a human or does not include a human? So it involves a human to actually create your data set. So okay. you, you do um, have to uh, make sure that, yeah, you have the ability to have a clean data set where you have already established what the labels are. Mm -hmm. And once your machine learning algorithm learns from that, it can now take an image that is similar to what it's already seen, but is not exactly what it's already seen and, and map there. And so this really, you know, brings up really important questions about, well, how do you get a massively da labeled data set, who is able to label that? Where does the labor come from? Under what conditions is the labor coming? And what are the, mm. what's the pay around and, that? And where does that, that intellectual that. property, and where does that intellectual property reside? Like all that labor is capital investment. So who owns that too? Exactly. And these are kind of, you know, important and open questions. I mean, this comes up with GPT, which is not an instance of supervised learning, and I'll get to that. But even just in, in other settings where you have large amounts of data that are being analyzed for input to a machine learning model, kind of how do you deal with the IP behind those images, especially depending on, you know, mm -hmm. if the outputs that turn out on the other side are, are really deeply informed by the mm -hmm. data that went in. So these are all really important and, and not open, open in the sense that, you know, there are people who have studied these questions, but I think it's, it's high time that we kind of bring any of those theories into practice at this point. Would, would you say the internet at large being basically um, servers worldwide with information at the edge in most cases, is most of that labeled data sets? Would you say that's mostly data la labeled data sets or not labeled data sets? I would say that's not labeled data sets. Okay. And, um, so you're really talking about some, some uh, a labeled data set example would be something like satellite images captured by X company that says, you know, this is a rooftop that has yeah. X amount of irradiation on it. It's a Southwest, blah, 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 this triangulation, et cetera. That would be a labeled data set, but it would also be considered a closed data set, right? Yeah. So that would be a labeled data set and a labeled data set doesn't, you know, inherently necessarily have to be closed or open. This is where sort of data sharing policies and, and things see. come into play. So in the I academic see. community, there are actually some common, what we call benchmark data sets, where um, they are open for the community to use. Hmm. But then additionally, again, it does take a lot of resources and um, both, you know, 
equipment resources and human resources and expertise to really mm. get these data sets together. And it does mm -hmm. mean that entities that collect them are often those with the most power and finances in society. And then they also, also often have an incentive to keep them proprietary because they want to generate value from them in some way mm. that others can't. Mm. So a lot of stuff to do there with incentives and how we really open up the landscape. Mm -hmm. Yeah.